Hi, Kira. How are you? Hi, Patty. I was just going to come your way. Baby. Because she like walked up to you and kind of went like was so excited that she wanted to play. You're her new BFF. I think look at that. Look at that. Happy darn Culture Cast Day. This is my interview number two in celebration of Black History Month, live from Washington, D.C. at the High Life Studios. I've got my friend Daryl Davis live and in person hanging out with us. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you, Marie. So glad to be here. Glad to hang out with you. Oh my gosh. It's so good to see you. And I know many of you were reaching out when you saw that Daryl was going to be joining on CultureCast. And I think we became friends like almost four years ago. Yeah, through, about that. Yeah, yeah. through a few, mutual friend, actually my husband, Michael, and through John Levy, right? That is correct. The influencer. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm super excited to have a conversation with you about First of all, who you are and how you roll. And what I mean by that is you've had this amazing global music career. And at the same time, you've done and put so much goodness into the world in just who you are. And so I want to really unpack that. But here's what I also want to unpack too. I mean, I think we all know that you are this R&B OG rock and roll musician. I will say that. But then I love what I read. Um, I think this was in in leading up to this week spending here in Washington D.C. at the Descendants um, group, the gathering that we had this week, is that you are not only a musician, you're a civil activist, and I love this term for you, racial reconciliator, OMG, and that's what we're all going to be talking about today. So I'm excited about that. Well, I'm excited to talk about it as well. Yeah, and actually, for those of you who saw our dog Akira is also hanging out so don't mind her if you see her so first of all Daryl I actually used a quote um that always sticks in my brain when I think about our conversations and I shared it as kind of a lead-in for anyone who hadn't met you yet which is which is how can you hate me if you don't even know me and I'm going to you know title our conversation that way I'd love to just dive into you know, who you are and like how you got into this world and what led you to this path of music first. So let's go there. And with the balance of your activism. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's go to the origin of yeah. that, of that quote. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? Uh, I'll be 66 years of age next month. Happy early birthday. Thank you. Thank you much. <laughs> but let's go back to my childhood. Okay. Uh, I am the child of parents who were in the US Foreign Service. So I grew up as an American embassy kid, traveling all over the world, starting at the age of three in 1961. And how it works is you're assigned to a country, a foreign country, yeah. you're there for two years, back home here for a year, maybe a few months, and then back overseas to another country. So every two years, uh, I was in different countries, going to different schools. And in between, I was home. I did uh, kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, seventh grade, all in different countries. Oh my goodness. So my first introduction to school was abroad. Yeah. And my classmates were from all over the world. You know, uh, whoever had an embassy where sure. we were assigned. Yeah, you know, my, they were from Nigeria, Japan, Russia, France, Germany, Italy, you name it. And so that being my first introduction to school became my baseline for right. what school was supposed to be, right? Yes. However, every time I'd come back home, after my dad's assignment, yeah. I would either be in all black schools or black and white okay, schools. Okay, where was home when you came back to the US? It varies. Okay. Um, sometimes Washington, D.C. area. Okay. <clears throat> but um, uh, also Massachusetts. Got it. 
Okay, so uh, obviously they're in all black schools or black and white schools, meaning yeah. the still segregated or the newly integrated. Mm -hmm. And just because uh, desegregation was passed by the Supreme Court four years before I was born, 1954, yeah. uh, it, didn't, it did not integrate schools overnight, right? Sure. I mean, right. even now in 2024, some places are still struggling with integration. Right. Okay, so anyway, one time when I came back, I was age 10, 1968, and we were in Massachusetts. And I was one of two black kids in the entire school. So consequently, all of my friends were uh, were white. Sure. And so it was a little black girl in second grade. I was in fourth grade. So some of my male friends were members of the Cub Scouts and invited me to join, which I did. And one day we had a parade. They had something up there called Patriots Day. Okay. Where all these groups marched from Lexington to Concord to celebrate Paul Revere's ride. So I was with, with you know with my uh, scout troop. Girl Scouts, Brownies, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, 4-H Club. I was the only black participant. Everything was great. Um, nothing but white people spectating, sure, waving, right, you know, right. cheering. And here I am. I even got to carry the American flag. Right? Very cool. So I'm marching with my troop. People were waving and cheering and yelling, the British are coming and all that kind of yeah. thing. Until we got to a certain point in the parade route when suddenly, pow, I'm getting hit with uh, bottles and soda pop cans and you know different small debris. <sighs> from the street, but just a small group of uh, white spectators off to my right on the sidewalk yeah. mixing with a larger crowd. And because I had no precedent for this kind of behavior, sure. I, I'm thinking, oh, you know, these people over here, I don't know what's wrong with them, but they don't like the scouts. They're, yeah, they're rowdy, you yeah, know? whatever. Yeah. And uh, I didn't realize I was the only scout getting hit until my den mother, my cub master, my troop leader all came running back and covered me with their own bodies and escorted me out of this uh, this danger. Uh, and, and nobody else is getting this treatment. Yeah. So I'm like wondering, well, I didn't do anything. Why Why are they doing this to me? I had no clue, no clue. And all my, my leaders would do was shush me and rush me along, tell me to keep moving, keep moving, it'll be okay. So I kept moving. Uh, fortunately, the people doing this uh, did not follow us. And at the end of the day, I still did not know what why this transpired. Sure. So uh, I went home, I, my, my leaders never told me, I went home, and my mom and dad were putting this mercurochrome and band-aids all over me and asking me, how did you fall down and get all scraped up? I told them I didn't fall down. I told them exactly what happened. And for the first time in my life, my mom and dad sat me down and explained to me what racism was. Oh, my goodness. Now, believe it or not, Marisa, at the age of 10, I had never heard the word racism. It did not exist in my sphere. Well, right. I, I was around people from all over the world. Yes. You know, we played together, went to school together, had slumber parties. Uh, we all got along. Yes. And this this thing my parents were telling me about, this thing called racism, I had no, my, my 10-year-old brain could not process the idea that somebody who had never spoken to me, never seen me, mm -hmm. knew nothing about me, would want to hurt me for no other reason than this, the color of my skin. Sure. So in my mind, my parents were were deceiving me. And, and to, and to oh. further prove my point, yeah. the people over here on the right side of me on the sidewalk who were doing this did not look any different to me than my friends at yeah, school right. or my fellow Americans overseas. Absolutely. Or for that matter, my little German, Danish, Swedish, yeah. Australian friends, right? So my parents had to be wrong. People don't do that because of the color of your skin. Come on. I didn't believe them. Oh my well, again, this yeah. is 1968, a very pivotal year yeah. in American history. And of course, the year that uh, Dr. King was assassinated. Yeah. So I quickly learned that what my parents had told me was true. So now I accepted this phenomenon called racism, but what I didn't understand was why, yeah. why does it exist? And that was when I formed that question at the age of 10, how can you hate me? You don't even know me. And for the next 55, almost 56 yeah. years, I've been looking for the answer to that question. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited that you shared that story, but also saddened by that story. I think it's amazing. I mean, I, when I'm hearing you talk about being a global citizen, it's so young, right? You've traveled all around the world. You've been educated amongst other global children and how that wasn't even um, a definition or a thought to you, like what racism was, because everyone kind of coexisted exactly. and there was not even a question, exactly. right? It was just a so, way of being, right? You know, and that that further prompted my, my mission yeah. to explore this because how can I go halfway around the world and be treated better than I'm treated in my own country. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think it's it's so impressionable too as what you learn as a child 
really forms your impression of the world. And then for that to change so quickly. Well, let me yeah. give you my, my yeah. very favorite quote of all time. Okay. And it's by Mark Twain, you know, uh, his real name, Samuel Clemens, yes. of course, right? But it's called the travel quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people lead us sorely upon these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And that is so true. And, you know, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, yeah. most Americans don't travel. I agree. Yeah. In fact, most don't even have passports. Um, so... All this travel, I've, you know, uh, today I'm, I'm a professional musician and lecturer. Yeah. And I've played, performed in all 50 states. I've traveled abroad. When you combine my childhood travels with my adulthood yeah. travels, I've been in uh, 63 countries uh, on six continents. But all this travel does not make me a better human being than someone with less travel. But what it has done is it has given me a broader perspective, yes. if you will, on humanity than most of people who have not been exposed to that. And I've got to tell you, it's possible had I not had all this travel as a child, you know, absorbing different cultures, would I be doing this race reconciliation work today? Maybe not. Okay. Maybe I would be staying <clears throat> as far away from those people as I could. Because, you know, a lot of people don't understand why would I want to sit down with people who hate me? Yeah, I think, though, what's interesting is that um, you and I had this conversation at dinner a couple months ago. We were talking about context. Remember when I was saying... And yet still things are still the same today in terms of not much progress sometimes in certain communities around um, racism. And, and then I'll well, use the other side, equality, yes, right? Yes. E equity, equality, and how it's, you set the, how you set the context and what, how do you do it in a way that people can relate to it? And um, anyway, I'm going back to you as a child, you've had all this experience with, you know, global perspectives and then, um, and then for those who are children here and maybe they haven't traveled anywhere, that's all I know. And so I love that quote by Mark Twain, unless you kind of broaden your perspective or broaden the context from where you sit, how can you begin to understand that there are actually people out there and this is just humanity in general. But today yeah. we have, the, you know, we, we live in perhaps one of the most diverse countries on the I planet. I totally agree. You know, um, I mean, I, I had to go across the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans to meet people. Today, they're all here, yeah. you know, and we have the internet, you know, but people don't take advantage of these things. Um, you know, technology ha has advanced, you know, by light years, but our ideology has been a little slow yes, to catch that up. Was, yeah, that was the conversation around context, the ide ideology. And I think although technology has advanced, I always say this, I always think the latest um, invention or the, the newest thing in technology is humanity in that there's no way that you can take advantage of it unless you actually apply judgment and emotion and empathy yeah. to what it is that you're utilizing that technology for. And that needs yeah. to get straight before we start implementing that into AI. Totally agree. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, here we are yeah. living, living in space age times, but still thinking with stone age minds. I love this. I mean, we can quote you all day. I mean it. <laughs> right. I love that. So let, let's talk about this. So you had this experience then at 10 and for the next 55, almost 56 years, you have been on this quest for, I'm going to use the word harmony. Yes. Because that means so many things to me when I think about you. So tell me about that. Okay. Well, what it means to me is this. Okay. As a profession, I'm a band leader. I'm yeah. a musician, right? When, I'm, when I play with somebody else, I'm a side man. In my band, I'm the band leader. And as a band leader, my job is to foster harmony on my stage, on yes. my bandstand between all the voices on my stage, whether they are the instrumental voices, piano, bass, drum, guitar, saxophone, whatever, or the vocal voices. Yes. I want harmony. The only time that I want dissonance is when I intentionally have it injected into the music for effect. Sure. Right? Because if dissonance happens randomly, uh, it's not noise. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. music. It's noise. Somebody hit a bad note, or you went out of tune, or something like that, right? So you want controlled dissonance. So uh, other than that, you want harmony. Yeah. So it's natural, you know, when the gig is over, curtain, you know, comes down, and I walk off the stage, and I and now I'm out in society. I want harmony around me there too. Yes. You know, I don't want to have to be fighting my way on my way home. 
you know, being discriminated against, pulled over for no re other reason than the color of my skin. Sure. You know, or things like that. I want harmony, just like I do on stage. That's right. So I think this was kind of meant to be, I mean, your gift for being a musician and actually living that from a technical music standpoint, but then in life, that's kind of a mantra for you. I mean, I'm going to fangirl a little bit about your history and your career as a musician. Tell us about like the funnest band members, leaders that you've worked with in your musical career. I've worked with a lot of them, but uh, my my uh, my greatest, my my most memorable, uh, has been the the man who invented rock and roll, yes. Charles Edward Anderson Berry, what? Chuck Berry. Go ahead, um, Chuck. I played yeah. with, I played with Chuck for about thirty two years. Oh my goodness! On, not, not, you know, not every gig, but on and off, uh, a good number of gigs. He was my my boss, my mentor, my idol, um, and most of all, he was my friend. I learned so much uh, from him, not just musically, but business-wise, yeah. et cetera. Um, the, man, the man was a pure genius. And, you know, my favorite song of all time is Johnny Be Good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to, to play that song on, the, on stage with the man who wrote it and see tens of thousands of people out there singing the words to his song yes. is just a thrill that you cannot believe. Yeah, I love this. And I, that's why I mentioned that you are an OG rock and roll. Just king in terms of what you've done and just one question i mean in honor of your mentor and friend you know, what's one big thing that you've learned you know if you were to boil it all down i know there's musically there's business wise there's probably also life wise what's one big lesson that you take away from your friendship with chuck berry music opens a lot of doors okay. it brings a lot of people together uh regardless of their race their religion their station in life whatever. Everybody likes music. So, you know, let's say, for example, um, tomorrow's Friday. Let's yeah. just say I don't have a gig. And so rather than be the entertainer and playing music so everybody else can dance, I want to go out and do some dancing myself. Right on. Right? Yeah. So uh, there's a club down the street. You know, maybe it's a band, maybe it's a DJ, but it's music and a dance floor. I'm there. So I'm there. The dance floor is full. A good song is on. And I'm looking around to see if I see a single person, single lady you know, unattached, I can dance with. Yeah. And I see this lady sitting at the bar unattached and she's like doing this on top of the bar yeah. in time to the music. Yeah. So obviously she likes the song, right? I, I don't know her. I'm going to walk over there and, um, hey, excuse me, you know, would you care to dance? Yeah. She says, sure. And I would go up on the dance floor. If it's a slow song, we got our arms wrapped yeah. around each other and we're turning around slowly on the dance floor. And I don't even know her, right? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And if it's a fast song, you know, we're apart, we're shaking. And at the end of the song, I escort her back to her seat. I thank her for the dance. Hi, my name is Daryl. And she says, hi, my name is Marisa. Yeah. And so she, um, she, says, she says, you know, what do you do, Daryl? And I say, well, you know, I, um, I'm a cashier at McDonald's. So, and I said, well, what do you do, Marisa? Yeah. And she says, I'm vice president of uh, Microsoft East Coast. Yeah. Whoa. You know, where were two people that far? Sure. On the socioeconomic spectrum come this close without even knowing each other's names yes music I, music brings you together i, and I yeah I, I just gave you a hypothetical example right all right so let me let me give you an entree into what i'm doing today yes and how music please. music facilitated this well i love that lesson though because it's just explained so much and who you are and what you've championed throughout the last 56 years so anyway well, go ahead so uh, there came a time when country music had made a, a resurgence. Yeah, it's, ne it's never gone away, um, but it had fallen off. You know, the top forty charts. Right. You know, different genres had popped up, disco and whatever else. Um, so anyway, a movie had come out called Urban Cowboy. Yeah. With uh, John Travolta, and had a mechanical bull and all these line dances, a lot of country music, big box office smash. So a lot of clubs and bars all over the country switched their format from top forty. The country, and so uh, you know, if you wanted to to make make a living playing music at that time, you played country. Sure. And I like country music. Country music and blues are the exact same music. Okay, same three chords. Yep. It's just society that divides us. Sure. And you know, classifies us. So it, to me, Hank Williams, father of country music, was a blues singer. He sang from the heart. He sang from the soul. Sure. He felt everything he sang. 
All right. Anyway, so I joined this country band that was pretty well established in Maryland. And um, I was the only black guy in the band, only black guy at most places where we played. And they had played a place up in a town called Frederick, Maryland, which is about maybe an hour and 20 minutes from where we're sitting right now. Yeah. And it was called the Silver Dollar Lounge. The Silver Dollar Lounge, I knew about it. Uh, I'd never been there, yeah. but I was very much aware of it. Had a reputation of being an all white lounge. You know, oh, black no. people were not welcome. There were no signs, you know, like we see back in the day, yeah. whites only, no yeah, colored, yeah. you know, whatever. But uh, you knew it had that reputation. And you know, if you go somewhere where you're not welcome and alcohol is being served, sometimes it's not a good combination. Well, you know how right? that is, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I do know how it yeah. is from firsthand experience. <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, um, the band had played there before. Well, now here I am in the Silver Dollar Lounge. Only black person in the place. And of course, I got a bunch of looks. But um, we finished the first set of music. People were dancing, carrying on, taking a break. I'm following the band to the band table, and I feel somebody from behind come up and put their arm across my shoulder. Now, I don't know anybody in this joint, right? So I'm turning around trying to see who's yeah. touching me. And it was a white gentleman, maybe 15, 18, maybe even 20 years older okay. than me. Big smile on his face. He says, man, I sure love your all's music. I said, thank you. He shook his hand. <laughs> and he pointed at the stage. He says, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? And I explained, well, yes, you probably did see them. They've played yeah. here before, but this is my first time. I just joined the band. Man, I sure love your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. And I was not offended, but I was rather surprised. Yeah. Given the fact that this guy was at least a decade and a half older right, than me. Right. That he did not know the black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's piano style. Oh, my goodness. And I proceeded to explain to him yeah. that Jerry got it from the same place I did. Yeah from black blues and boogie woogie piano players. That's where rock and roll rockabilly yeah. evolved. Oh, no, 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 Jerry Lee invented that. I ain't never heard no black man play piano like that. So I'm thinking, okay, well, a guy never saw Fats Domino or Little Richard, yeah. same boogie style, right? <laughs> and um, so he goes on and on. And I said, look, man, I know Jerry Lee Lewis. He's a good friend of mine. He's told me himself, you know, where he his influences came from. He didn't believe that either. But he was fascinated and want me to come back to his table allow him to buy me a drink. Wow. Now, I don't drink alcohol, but I went back to his table and I had a cranberry juice. Sure. He paid the waitress. He took his glass and he clinks my glass. Okay. And he says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And now I'm baffled. Like, how can this be? Because at that point in my life, I had sat down literally, literally with thousands, tens of thousands sure. of white people or anybody else yeah. and had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. How is it that this guy had never done that? And I wasn't trying to be facetious. I was just innocently naive. I said, why? Yeah. I, I wasn't tuning in, yeah. right? And he didn't answer me. He stared at the tabletop. I asked him again. He didn't answer. His buddy said, tell him, tell him. I said, tell me. Yeah. And he says, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. OMG. <laughs> so I, I can't. Yeah. I, I just burst out laughing because I didn't believe him. You thought he was joking. I thought he was yeah, joking. Yeah, yeah. Because I know a whole lot about the Klan. And, uh, you know, they don't just come up and embrace you, want to buy you a drink and hang out. Right. You know, yeah, so this guy's pulling my leg. I'm laughing. He goes inside his pocket, pulls out his wallet, flips through it, and hands me his clan membership card. I look at this. Whoa. I recognize the clan insignia, yeah. which is a red circle, white cross, blood drop. And um, I said, well, this thing is for real. So I stopped laughing because it wasn't funny. I gave it back to him. And we talked about the clan and different things. Yeah. And um, he gave me his number, wanted me to call him anytime I was to play there. He wanted to bring his friends, meaning Klansmen and Klanswomen, yeah, to see me. Because yeah. he loved your music so much and your piano playing so much. Exactly. Well, he was, he was, I was a novelty. He was fascinated. Okay. That, that, that yeah. Well, he thought it was his music. <laughs> right. So he was fascinated that a black guy could got play it, his got music. Got it, got it. Okay. So anyway, I call him every six weeks and say, hey, man, you know, we're down at the Silver Dollar. Come on out. He'd bring Klansmen and Klanswomen. You know, they'd come not in robes and hoods, but, you know, you know regular clothing, well, of course, right? right? Well, you never know. That would be wild, though. <laughs> well, yeah. I've seen them in that. Oh, you know, my that, goodness. That would come later. Yeah. So anyway, uh, he'd bring them, and they would, they were, you know, they'd gather near the stage and watch me play, get out on the dance floor and dance. And then, um, you know, I'd go visit his table on my break. Some of them would leave when they saw me coming. Others would hang there. They're yeah. curious. So this went on for a while, and then I quit that band. I went back to playing rock and roll and whatever else. 
And uh, a few years later, it dawned on me, Daryl, you blew it. The answer to your question that's been plaguing you yes. since the age of 10, it fell right into your lap and you didn't even realize it. Who better to ask that question of than someone who would go so far as to join an organization that has over a hundred year history yeah. of practicing hating people? Yeah. You ever heard of that? Well, I mean, you know, you, you join an organization to practice you know, football or, or ping pong right. or stamp collecting or whatever, but you practice an organ, you join an organization to practice hating. Yeah. You know, okay. Ugh. So who better to ask that question of? Get back in contact with that guy. Write a book. Because all the books I have, every book written yeah. on the plan was written by, by white authors. Obviously they had more access to right. black people without fear of, you know, whatever. And uh, there've been two books that dealt with the Klan, written by Black authors, but each author detailed how he escaped a lynching. First author in the 1930s oh and the other yeah. one in the 1940s. Uh, I wanted to sit down with my prospective lynchers and ask them face to face, how can you hate me? Yeah. You don't even know me, right? Yes. So I decided that's what I'm gonna do. So I sought out that guy that I met, the Klansman, uh, up in Frederick, and um, I persuaded him, he was resistant, I persuaded him to give me the, the phone number and address of the uh, clan leader uh, for, for this area. And he, he finally did it on the condition that I not tell the man where I got his that information. That you got the number right. right. And he knew that you specifically wanted to understand the answer to that question with the clan leader. Yes. Okay, you told yeah. him, yeah. And so that's how the quest began. And I began traveling all over the country, up north, down south, Midwest, west, interviewing different clan leaders and different members. Initially, I would not let them know that I was black. I would have my white secretary call them right. and say, hey, my boss is writing a book on the Klan. Would you consent to sitting down and giving him an interview? Yeah. Um, some would say yes. Many would say yes. Others would say no. No, we don't, I don't talk about that. Blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I told her specifically, do not tell them I'm black. Yeah. Uh, of course, not today. Of course, they all know, right? Right, right, right. But um, so a lot of them did not know. And they were shocked when they saw me. So uh, yeah. some some refused to talk to me. Others wanted to fight me. Uh, and then wow. most of them, you know, were you know would, would consent to sitting down. I'm really curious about one of the first opportunities where someone actually realized, oh, it's a black man, you know, person requesting you this interview. How do you do that? You know, that is. How do you do what? Yeah. How did you actually so that you meet them, and what what was that like? Well, you know, I mean, they're human beings, just like anybody yeah. else, but human beings with a distorted sense of reality. Um, you know, I don't, I don't look at the at the Robin Hood, yeah, um, because I know people who have the same mentality as somebody in a Robin Hood, except they wear a uniform with a badge and a gun. They wear a Hawaiian shirt and Bermuda shorts. Sure. They wear a suit and tie. They may wear a judge's robe. So don't worry about what the person is wearing. Yeah. Worry about what's here and what's here. Yeah. What they're feeling and what they're thinking. You know, don't let the uh, the attire yeah. throw you. Yeah. So um, in your interview, so here you are, all all of these clans leaders are agreeing to meet with you, and then when they see you, they the ones who agree to Some sit down. Some of them down, freak out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they freak out, but then they agree to sit down with you. Um, when you talk about what they're feeling and what they're thinking. Like what themes were you gathering from that? Well, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, I say to this one leader, well, you know, how can you hate me? You don't even know me. Yeah. I mean, you just met me five minutes ago and all you see is my skin color. Mr. Davis, you have to understand one thing. You know, black people are prone to crime. And this is evidenced okay. by the fact that uh, there are more black people in prison than white people. He is 100% correct. The data, the statistics yeah. show that there are more blacks incarcerated than whites for the same crime. Okay, that's all he needs, that data, to support his narrative. Yeah. Right? He doesn't know the data doesn't tell you why they're in there. That's right. It just tells you that they're in there. But he doesn't bother to research why, to, to, to research maybe the imbalance in our judicial system, right? He has that data, he supports it, he believes it. All right. And then he goes on to say, um, you know, that uh, that black people are inherently lazy. We always have our handout, you know, for a freebie. Uh, we, we we seek to, uh, to to exploit the welfare system, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And then um, to say, you know, that black people, and I've heard this a million times, black people are born 
with a smaller brain than oh, white no. people. And this is evidenced by the, by the fact that, um, that black kids every year score lower on the SATs, the, the scholastic aptitude yeah. tests, than, uh, than white kids do. And the larger the brain, the more uh, space for, for intelligence capacity, smaller the brain, the lower the IQ. Yeah. And this is evidenced by, by the SAT scores. And so now the man has called me a criminal. He's called me lazy. Sure. And now he's calling me dumb. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all within 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and he's never seen me before in his life. Yeah. Okay. So here's a very, very important thing. Okay. A lot of people get triggered when somebody attacks, you know, who they are. Yeah. Right. Um, was what he was saying offensive? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Was I offended by what he was saying? Absolutely not. Yeah. And the reason being is because I know myself. That's right. Right? Do not go into a situation without knowing who you are. Because if you do, they will tell you who you are, and you might walk out believing them. Totally right? agree. So have your self-esteem intact. Know who they are. Know who you are. All right? So... I didn't let it rattle me, you know. Now, if my mother told me or my dad told me, you know, Daryl, you know, you're you're kind of prone to crime or something, or you know, you're lazy, right. you know, you don't clean up your room, or you're kind of dumb, you know, you brought an F on your report card. Maybe I would believe them because they brought me into the world, they raised me, but not somebody who's never seen me before. And all he sees is my skin color, and he makes these assessments of me. Yeah. Why? Why should I believe a lie? Why should I be offended by a lie? The guy is wrong. Why should I be offended? Right. Right. So. Keep yourself in check. Don't get triggered because they're used to pushing triggers. Totally. They do agree. it all day in and day out. Well, and I, they know those reactions and that's what they thrive on. This is such a good lesson, though. And I think feel like every leader that I've had the chance to interview mm -hmm. on Culture Cast, and we were just talking about this with Ken just you know a couple of hours ago. And I like to say it this way: um, you know, check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? That's so right. like really understand. Like who you are, and we were just talking about this, Ken and I were a couple of hours ago. You know, I think the big lesson learned, whether or not you're interacting with a clans leader or just another human being who you may not know, mm -hmm. it really starts with, and, and also when things might it feel like are happening to you, the place to start is with you. And I think it's really about like we said this just last time, you know. Get really clear about who you are, where you came from, honor that, be confident in that, and stand in that, right. right? And I think that will get you further in life, and that will help you navigate your path to whatever you define as success, you know, as that. And I think in this instance, just having that self-confidence and knowledge of who you are, you're right. They just don't know you. And they and, yeah. what, and what happens is this, like, I, you know, so... Yeah. You know, I don't attack the guy. Yeah. Okay. I just sit back and listen. And there's a reason because I tell you what I've learned in all my travels, no matter how far I go from my own country, the United States, whether it's right next door to Canada, right next door to Mexico, yeah. or halfway around the globe, no matter how different the people may be that I encounter, they don't look like me, speak my language, or worship yeah. as I do, or whatnot. Uh, I always conclude that everybody is a human being. And as such, every human being in the world wants these five core values in okay. their lives. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to be respected. We all want to be heard. We want to be treated fairly and truthfully. And we want the same things for our family as anybody else wants for their family. And if we can learn to apply those five core values, when we find ourselves in an adversarial situation, or a society or a culture in which we are yeah. unfamiliar or uncomfortable, I will guarantee you that the navigation of that of that situation, that culture, that society will be much more smooth and much more positive. So I I sit back and I listen to the person. I respect you know their right to say what they want to say. Yeah. I may not respect what they're saying, sure, but I respect their right to say it. And as a result, because you know when the person first walks in the room, a clan leader, and they see me, they tense up. You know, because they're not expecting yeah. me, right? They see this and their wall goes up. They're ready to attack. All right. But I don't attack them. I I I'm down. I'm I'm giving them the space. Yes. I'm giving I'm giving those five values, right? Yeah. That wall begins to come down. Because so now after the person has done 
exhausting all their vitriol on me. Now it's my turn. They're curious. How come this black guy didn't push back and, yeah. and jump in my face? You know? So now it's my turn to respond. I could say, no, you're the criminal. Yeah, you're yeah, the yeah. one hanging black men from trees and dragging them behind pickup trucks and bombing their churches, et cetera, right? And I'd be 100% correct. The Klan has over 150 year history of doing that. Sure. But if I did that, the wall would go right back up, their ears would plug up. That's right. I want to keep the wall down, their ears open so they can hear what I have to say. So rather than go on the offense, I go on the defense. But I've already done my homework on this person. I I don't have a criminal record. Yeah. So I said, you know, I'm as, I'm as black as anybody you've ever seen. Yeah. You know, I don't have a criminal record. My mom and dad don't have a criminal record. I already know that this guy is sitting across from me, barely made it out of high school. Right. Okay. I have a college degree, but I'm not going to throw that in their face. Sure. Right. Um, I also know that my SAT scores got me into college, and the right. reason, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason. Um, that you know, he's correct in saying that they're, you know, black kids have lower SAT scores. But where do most black kids in this country go to school? Right. What in the inner city. Education? Right. And where do most white kids go to school? In the suburbs. Fact, inner city schools are not as good as qualified as suburban schools. Black kids who go to school in the suburbs can score just as high, if not higher, sure. than some of the white kids. White kids who go to school in the inner city can score just as low, if not lower, than some of the yeah. black kids. It has nothing to do with the color of the kid's skin or the size of the kid's brain. That's right. But has everything to do with the educational system in which that child is enrolled, which is why whenever as parents you move somewhere, the first thing they want to do is check out the school system. Is this where I want to send my, my kid to school? Because they know school shapes that kid's future, right? That's right. So, you know, I let him exhaust all that. And then I give him all these, these reasons. Now, I don't attack him. I just tell him about me. I have I, I got into college. Yeah. I'm black. I don't have a criminal record. I've never been on welfare. So that causes a cognitive dissonance. Yes. All right. And when he goes home, he thinks about that. And when he finds out, you know what, what that Daryl Davis guy said is true. Oh, but he's black. But what he said made sense. Oh, but he's black. It's, it's a cognitive dissonance. Sure. And they struggle with that for a while. And it comes to the point where they have to decide, do I accept the truth? Because I know it's right. to be true, right. and now I change my ideological path, or do I deny the truth and continue living a lie? Yeah, just because of his skin color. In most cases, people will choose the path of least resistance, which is the truth. All right, but there'll be those who will go to their grave being hateful, violent, and racist. Absolutely. But as a result of them changing their um, their ideological path, they end up giving me their robes and hoods, their swastika flags, all kinds of stuff. When that happens, though, I mean, that's insane. I think the number, and actually amazing at the same time, the number of former leaders who have done that with you where they're like, let me, I, I, I see the truth for myself, and now they're giving you. You know, hate you know, is exhausting. Yeah. And, and every one of them, whether they know each other or not, they all say the same thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a burden off of me. You know, they wake up in the morning. Who am I going to hate on today? Now I hate today, I'm going to hate the gays. I'm going to hate the Jews. I'm going to hate the Muslims. I'm going to hate the blacks. You know, the, it, seriously, it's, it's, it's a business. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's exhausting. So how many leaders have come to you after multiple conversations or pondering the inter interchange with you? You know, I've been doing this now as a 2024, 42 years. Oh, my goodness. And I've got a tons of robes and hoods and things like that. Not all from leaders, some some leaders, a lot of leaders, yeah. but also members. And, um, you know, but it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight in sure. most cases. It's incremental. Uh, you know, you have to come back. You know, if first time you meet them, you're planting a seed. Yep. You know, but you got to come back and nourish that seed, water it. Yeah. So it grows. Because, you know, they are surrounded by an echo chamber. Sure. That reinforces everything that they believe. And you have upset that apple cart. Have you remained friends? With when, many when you, of these people, yes, I okay. have best friends even. Yeah, and uh, you know, when you, when you make friends with me, you got a friend for life. That's right. Yeah, I think I saw. I've a, invited yeah. some to my wedding. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. and I think you've been invited to their family's weddings. I have been invited. I, I even um, participated in, yeah, uh, in, a, in one of their weddings. That's weddings. right. I think there was a video of you and a story that I saw on CNN yeah. and other news channels. I walked about a clan that. bride down the aisle. How did that happen? Just. Oh God! Um, well, this was was a, a national clan leader, and uh, he'd gotten in some trouble. Okay. 
and he was really getting you know uh, nailed for it, even more so than than what what was deserved. And um, yes, he, he he did do certain things for which he should be punished and serve time. Which he did, but I defended him on other things that were just being thrown to see what sticks on the wall. Yeah. And so um, he and I developed a relationship, a trust, and his clan's lady fiance, and you know, got to know them, work with them. Show I took them, I took them to the African American Museum. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. Yeah, and showed them different things. You know, let them see things they would never see otherwise. Yeah. Right. And so that it it fostered a friendship. You know, when you start this far apart on the ideological spectrum. You talk with your worst enemy for five minutes, you will find something in common. Yes. And that gap will close a little bit. You keep on talking another five minutes, you found more in common. When you get here, you are having a relationship yeah. with your adversary. You know, you might not be going out to happy hour with the person, sure. but you're having a cordial relationship. You keep on talking, you have found more in common. And now you know you're, you're on a friendly basis. But by the time you get here, you have found more in common than you have in contrast. And the trivial things you have in contrast, such as skin color, or whether you go to a mosque, a temple, a synagogue, right. or a church, begin to matter less and less. And they begin wondering, why did I hate that person? It doesn't even make sense. That's right. Well, I think I go back to, you know, the five core values, and it, it all starts and ends with love. And what I mean by that, because we were talking about earlier, it's like, it's exhausting to always be hating. Yes. Right? Like that takes a toll mentally, emotionally, physically, all of that. And to like lean on love and be open. And I think the other lesson that I'm hearing is that, you know, things don't happen immediately as well. Right. It's not like, hey, I did one thing and how come, you know, whatever I'm trying to do is not happening. It takes time. It takes time, right. Right. And you know, the day the day you pass the uh the legal bar does not make you a good lawyer. That's the right. Day you get your driver's license does not make you an expert driver. It you know, qualifies you to get yeah. out the street and drive, but only experience gives you that ex the, uh, that expertise. Right. And I, I think the other lesson that I'm hearing you talk about, too, is um, once you kind of create a space where the guards are down, you know, with your five core values, and I'll just call it all love, because to me that is coming from a place of love and openness, then you're open to finding what's common in between you. Right. And over time, I know it takes time to build relationships versus just adversaries, you know, relationships, friendships that um, it is kind of the answer is look for the commonality, because as human beings. That's who we are. When two enemies are talking. Yeah, they're not fighting. They're talking. They may be disagreeing. They may even be talking loud. That's right. But at least they're talking. It's when the conversation ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So you want to keep the conversation going. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, this one clan leader, first time I interviewed him, uh, he came, uh, he didn't know I was black. Uh, again, my white secretary had called him and set up the interview yeah. to tell him. And um, so he shows up at this motel room where she and I are. And there's a knock on the door. Mary, my secretary, gets up, goes around the corner, opens the door, in walks this guy's bodyguard. And he's wearing military camouflage. Got the Ku Klux Klan insignia, uh -oh. red circle, yeah. white cross patch here. The letters KKK on this side, embroidered on his cap. It said Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh boy! And yeah. here he had a semi-automatic handgun. So he comes around the corner and sees me sitting there, and he just like froze. And um, his boss, the, the Klan leader, is on the other side of the corner. He comes around, not realizing that his bodyguard stopped short. Yeah. And slams it into this guy's back knocks the guy forward, and they both oh, are no. stumbling around trying to regain their balance, looking all over the place. And I'm just sitting there at the table looking at them, and I can read their faces. Yeah. I know what they're thinking. Did the desk clerk give us the wrong room number, or is this an ambush? <laughs> this is a setup, right. right? I stood up, and I went like this to show I had nothing in my hands. And I walked towards the guy, and I said, I'm Daryl Davis. Put my hand up. He shook my hand. And the bodyguard shook my hand. So far, so good. So I said, yeah, please, come on, have a seat. And um, he came in and he sat down and um, everything was fine there. I had a little bag beside me. Bodyguard stood at attention to his right. Yeah. And every time I would go in the bag to pull out the Bible, because the Klan claims to be a Christian organization. Okay. And the, you know, the, the Bible says, according to them, that blacks and whites should be separate. I want to be here. Please show me chapter and verse where it says that, right? So I, I pull up my Bible or pull out some recording thing. And... Um, 
every time I go down into the bag this way, the bodyguard reach up that way. Yeah. It's done. So after a while, he realized there was no threat in the bag, and I went in and out. He didn't. He didn't move. He trusted. You know, nothing in there. So this guy and I are just talking, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there was a very fast, very short noise. I got, Shh, and we all jumped. Yeah. And I jumped up out of my chair and I hit the table. And the noise was so short and so fast that my ear could not discern what it was. So therefore, I perceived it to be an ominous, threatening noise. Yeah. I was already told by the guy who gave me this guy's number and address, Daryl, don't fool with him. He will kill you. And so I had all that running through my head. And, you know, when you, you know, when you fear for your life, your safety, you go into what's called survival mode. Sure. And in survival mode, there are only a few things you can do. Some people, they just they pass out, they faint. The fear is so great, their brain doesn't process it and just shuts down. Uh, I don't do that. Other people, they'll, they'll tighten up, they'll constrict like this and start shaking and they can't move. You can be punching them, kicking them. You know, they're not even trying to deflect. Yeah. But, um, you've seen anybody get into a fight and they ball up into a fetal position. That's uh, it's called paralysis by fear. And I don't do that either. Third thing people will do is to run away. Yeah. That is your best option. As quickly as you can, separate yourself right. from the source of the yep. fear. Get away from it. And that is the option that I would have chosen had it been available. Right. It was not You're available. In a hotel because room. Yeah. I'm, you know, yeah. how can I? I'm in a motel room. And I don't have like, a gun. Yeah. This guy has a gun. Um, I cannot outrun a bullet, especially in a motel room. And my secretary is not armed. I'm not armed. So your last option is to do a preemptive strike. Get them before they get you. And when I flew out of that chair, I was on my way to dive across that little lamp table yeah. and grab the uh, clan leader, grab the uh, the bodyguard, and slam them down to the ground, take away the bodyguard's gun, and just immobilize the situation. But when I hit the table, I'm looking right into the clan leader's eyes. And I didn't say a word, but I knew he could read my eyes. My eyes were saying, what did you just do? And his eyes were staring into mine, asking the same question. And the bodyguard had his hand on his gun. He never pulled it out. He had his hand on the butt of the gun, looking at both of us like, what did either one of you all just do? Yeah. And Mary was sitting on top of the dresser. She realized what had happened. And she began explaining it when it happened again. And we all began laughing. Oh, no. There was an ice bucket sitting next to her where we had cans of soda in yeah. there getting cold. And the ice was melting and the cans were oh, falling down were the falling. ice. Yeah. So, that was it. And so we all laughed at how ignorant we all had been. But this was a, I won't say this was a learning moment. That would come later. Okay. It was a teaching moment. Yeah. And the lesson taught is this. All because some foreign, underscore, highlight, circle the word yeah. foreign entity of which we were ignorant. Yeah. Had entered into our comfort zone. We, we became fearful of one another. Because we fear those things of which we are ignorant. Right. Right. Ignorance breeds fear. Yes. If we don't keep that fear in check, that fear will escalate into hatred because we hate the things that frighten us. If we don't keep that hatred in check, that hatred in turn will escalate into destruction. Yes. We want to destroy the things that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. But guess what? At the end of the day, they may have been harmless and we were simply ignorant. So we saw that whole chain almost unfold to completion where, you know, where had, had the Nighthawk or the bodyguard drawn his gun and shot me or my secretary, oh. or had I pounced across the table and hurt one of them. That story is unbelievable. And the fact that everyone had the courage to realize, oh, you're, you know, Mary, the secretary is saying it's actually the ice melting right? and the cans are dropping. And I think about, um, it's exactly what we were talking about earlier. It's check the data. Right. Like there's assumptions that everyone's making that it's this foreign thing that's coming in, but it's how we think about things. If it's something we're not familiar with, we just make assumptions. Right. Versus really, one's perception yeah. is one's reality. That's right. You know, and here's here's something yeah. that's, that's very, very important that we all need to learn. You, myself, anybody, we cannot change somebody's reality. Only they can change their reality. Yes. All right. One's perception is one's reality. Even if it's not real, it's still their reality. It's real to them. Right. So if you want their reality to change, do not attack it. Don't tell them you're wrong. 
right. you know, stop that or do this or do that, um, that you will get resistance because to them it's real and you are attacking you know, who they are, they're, they're the real. So don't attack the reality. If you want their reality to change, offer them a better perception or better perceptions. Right. And if they resonate with your perception, then they will change their own reality because their perception becomes their reality. That's right. Let me give you a, yeah, a, that's a right. quick example. Yeah. Um, hypothetical example. Let's say you have a seven or eight-year-old brother. and He goes with his buddies to a magic show. And he comes back and tells you, Marisa, you're not yeah. going to believe this. You know, this magician on stage asked for a female volunteer and 50 women raised their hand. And he picked one out of the audience, brought her up on stage and had her climb into this long box and put her feet out the hole at that end and her head out the hole at this end. And then he closed the lid. He took a chainsaw and went right down to the middle of the box. Yeah. Came out the bottom. He cut her in half. And then he told her to wiggle her feet out that hole. And she wiggled her feet. And you say, listen, it didn't really happen. Yes, it did. I was yeah. there. I saw it. You weren't even there. I saw it with my own eyes. He is 100% correct. He was there. He saw it. You were not there. You did not see it. Right. And you're telling him that he's wrong. You have attacked his reality and he's upset. That's right. And rightfully so. Okay. You know that that can't be done. He's seven or eight years old. He doesn't know that. All right. But you have, but he's right. You were not there. You didn't see what he saw. That's right. Okay. So it's, it's real to him. And then, and to make it even more real, he tells you after the man cut this box into two halves, he moved the half with the feet over here to stage right. And the half of the head over here is yeah. left, right? And then he walked over and talked to that woman's head, and she spoke back to him. Yeah. And then he brought the two halves back together. He said, abracadabra, over yeah. top of the box, opened the lid, and the lady climbed out. She was cut in half, put back together, and no blood. And you said, listen, that's an illusion. No, it's not. I'm telling you. I yeah. saw it. You know what? You have attacked him again. Now he's really pissed. All right? He might even disown you as right. his sister, right? Right. So rather than attack his reality, give him a, offer him a better perception. Say, listen, I hear what you're saying, but do you think that maybe it's possible that perhaps, yeah. you know, when, when this man asked for a female volunteer and he chose a lady out of the audience, you think maybe it's possible that particular lady works for him? She travels all over the country yeah. with him, sits in that same theater seat everywhere they go. So he zooms right in on her. And when, and when she comes up on stage and climbs in the box, there's already a pair of mannequin dummy legs lying on the floor of the box that are wearing the same stockings yeah. and same high heels she has on. She picks up the handles of those legs and shoves them out the hole, brings her own knees up under her chest. So her whole body is on that half of the box. When the saw passes through, it never touches her. And when he says, you know, wiggle your feet, she just grabs those handles. Yeah. And shakes them, right? And then when he separates the two halves, those feet can no longer move. So he has to direct your attention away from looking at those feet. He walks over to where the head is and he talks to the lady. Of course she's not talking. Yeah. Back. Her whole body's there. That's right. But you don't know that. You think half her body is over there, right? But your eyes are with him. So then when he brings it back together, those two halves, she simply pulls those handles, leaves the legs on the floor of the box. And when he opens the lid, she climbs there she out. Is. Yeah. And then your brother says, hmm, you know, that might be the only way that could work. You've offered him a better perception. He has resonated with it. And now he has changed his own reality. That's how you affect change. Yes. I love it. I think um, the way I relate to it is I have found that I use the words meeting people where they're at. Mm -hmm. So they may have a different different perception, a different reality mm -hmm. of their view. And that's okay. I think part of it is like being okay with people are going to come from different perspectives, different right. contexts, different realities. And it is about being willing to have the patience to meet them where they're at. And in that example that you gave of me and my little brother, for example, it's like, okay, I can see why you would experience that. Mm -hmm. And then share the data. Like to me, it's one thing to go, I'm going to try and change your perception, but let me tell you why I think that. And here's the information to keep that open. So I love it. It's a whole example of, again, another way of um, 
acting kind is actually putting your feet in another person's shoes and meeting them where they're at. Right. I think like having the patience to do that again, and it starts from this core value of love. The key, yeah. you said the key word, Marisa, patience. Yes. Okay, today it's like, this is how it is. This is the reality. That's you don't right. believe me, I cancel you, done. That's right. Yeah, no patience. <laughs> That's right. I think it also, it takes time and patience. Now, I know that we had the chance to visit a couple days ago. Um, we just met with, my last culture cast was with Ken Morris, who um, has the Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives organization and, you know, was a key friend that we supported in helping to pull together the descendants. I'd love to hear your take. I mean, you were there on Tuesday. You met it, if not a few, if not all, of the descendants of Malcolm X, of um, Ida B. Wells, Rosa Parks, Jesse Jackson, um, Emmett Tills. Gosh, I know I'm missing some people, but you met some people and you also participated in some events. Would love kind of your take and what you experienced. Like to help the audience understand, like what Absolutely. did you experience? I think, yeah. I think this was a fantastic uh, event. I'm so glad to have been invited to it and be a, and be a part of it. Because right now we're living in a world where our history is being erased. It's being banned from being taught in schools. Yes. It's being rewritten, omitted, and totally changed, you know, re you know, revisioned, if you will. Um, so to have something like this bring people together, uh, some of these people, you know, may have met each other in the past in different events. Yeah. Many of them had not. Yeah. But to have though, you know, those people, that those legacies in the same room at the same time is amazing and something that I hope will will continue perpetually because the these people are just like the Ben Franklins, the Thomas Jeffersons, yes. the Eli Whitney's, the uh, Thomas Edison's, you know, those people that contributed to the fabric of this country, we also contributed. And there are many others of all different uh, uh, heritage. Yeah. Okay. And to be able to do that and show show this country the foundations upon which it was built, and and these and these these are uh, these people who have who have inherited those legacies, I think is a is a phenomenal thing that should be preserved. Now, I, I have a different take. Yeah. On Black History Month, myself. Okay, let's hear it. Well, um, I've been saying this now for twenty four years, and granted, there are going to be people who would disagree with me, and that's fine. Okay, but here is my take. I think it is time to get rid of Black History Month. And I'll tell you why. There was a time when we needed Black History Month. There was a time when no Black history was being taught yeah. in schools. It was called American history. It may as well have been called white history because that's all it was. Right. White people were, giving, were being given credit for places they did not discover and for things they did not invent. How do you go somewhere and people are already there and yeah, you discovered it, right? But uh, anyway, um, we had to fight very, very hard to, against resistance to getting some of our history taught in schools. A man named Carter G. Woodson led that fight, and he was able to establish the first teachings of Black history in schools. It was called Negro History Week. Yes. All right? Yeah. And, and we are very grateful to have that because we had nothing. All right? We, were, we needed it. All right? We continued the fight and fought harder, and finally we got one month albeit the shortest month of the year, all right, February, uh, 28 days. But we accepted that month for two reasons. It was the birth month of two of our heroes, Frederick Douglass, right. whose descendants were there yes. as well, and Abraham Lincoln, right. okay, who freed the slaves. So we accepted that month, February. But then we became complacent. We stopped fighting. All right. Yes, we needed Black History Month, all right, and I'm glad we had it. But the problem is, it has become detrimental. And let me explain. Every February, little black boys and girls, little white boys and girls, little American yeah. kids are, are subliminally being brainwashed oh, into no. believing yeah. that there's only a half a dozen black people in this country who contributed to the fabric of America. Because every uh, February, we study the same people. Nothing wrong with these people, don't get yeah. me wrong. Um, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, and one or two other ones. Yeah. 
By the time we get through half a dozen, oh, we did our black thing. February's over. Let's move on. Okay. And we move on. We never revisit those people until next February. All right. So by the time June rolls around, yeah, you say to some fifth else, grader, right. yeah, you say to some fifth grader uh, in June, you know, right, right before they, they matriculate to the next grade, uh, you say, so who was uh, Harriet Tubman? Oh, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she was that black lady who refused to give up her seat on the bus. Oh, no. You know, they got her yeah. confused with Rosa Parks. Yeah, right, right. Because there's no reinforcement. That's right. But yet we study Ben Franklin, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, on and on and on, Francis Scott Key, all year long. It's constantly reinforced. We never forget who flew the kite, lightning hit the key. Yeah, yeah, we don't, yeah. We all know it's Ben Franklin, right? But every February, when you keep talking about the same half a dozen people, what about Garrett Morgan? Who invented the traffic light, the guy who invented the ironing board or the gas mask or any number of other things? Oh, well, you know, we didn't have time. We only had 28 days. Okay, There are hundreds, thousands of other black people. Okay? I'm not saying take away anything from these people. Yes, we need those people. Right. But let's get rid of Black History Month. Let's take that information and put it where it belongs, under the umbrella of American right. history, which totally is what it agree. is, and teach it all year long. Your month. As a woman, yeah, it's March. It's March. It's coming around. You do not. Right. You do not stop being a woman after March totally any agree. any more so that I stop being black after February. Well, it's so okay. Yeah, it's so, so we can teach black history in September too. Right. Okay. And same thing. Women. You know why? Why do we need to relegate somebody's history to a month? It's American history. Teach it all year long. I agree. Okay? So that's my point. Obama, President Barack Obama, became the first black president. We can't talk about him in September because he's part of Black History. We can only talk about Obama in February. Yeah. How stupid is that? I think now I re yeah. at 66, I remember as a kid, the Miss America beauty pageant. Okay. Yeah. When I was a kid, black women were not allowed to participate to compete in Miss America. They, they were forbidden, all right? Because they were not deemed beautiful enough to represent Miss America. It was only white females. Right. And the judges were only white males. Right. Okay. They did not want white men judging on the beauty of a black woman. And there were only two categories way back then, the swimsuit and the evening yeah. gown. So women were being objectified. Objectified. Absolutely. Right? Okay. They, you know, they didn't have to write essays and do this and do that. They weren't right. talented. They just want to look at them. That, that was the mentality. <laughs> right. So what did that do for black women? It gave them low self-esteem yep. that they were not beautiful enough to compete. So what did we do to elevate their esteem? We created the Miss Black America beauty pageant and gave black girls something to aspire to. They can get their own crown, yeah. et cetera, right? And that elevated their esteem. It worked for a while. And then finally, Miss America, the big main yeah. pageant, finally came to its senses and opened its doors. Yeah. So today, any everybody, every yeah. every American woman can, you know, can compete. And since that time, we've had four Miss Americas who've been black, starting with uh, Vanessa Williams. Yeah, Vanessa Williams. And then Debbie Turner, yeah. and I forgot the other two names. All right. So now we don't need Miss Black America because the main one is now it's open to everybody. So when are we going to come into, into, into the 21st century and put Black history where it belongs? Well, why, why yeah. do we, you know, yes, we've needed it. But, but when you constantly put the same half a dozen people every year, you subliminally brainwash people and think, oh, there were only six or seven Black people that ever didn't yeah. come to this country. Well, I totally hear your your point on all of that. And actually, it's interesting. Um, the people I was traveling with the, on the buses to our different events this week, we were talking about Black History Month and Pride and Women's History Month, all of that. And the funny thing is, we were talking about, but you know, just because June rolls around and it's Pride Month doesn't mean that I'm not LGBTQ plus any other month of the year, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I hear you and I get that perspective. I also think, you know, going to what the lessons learned from our conversation is around patience. And I mean, it's going to take a long time. I think the sad news is, but then there's good news too. The sad news is, look, that month shouldn't just be about, we're only going to study it during this month. And once we run out of time, we're going to move on to something else, which is kind of, what I'm hearing you say, I think the other point is it's a starting point, right? For let's say newer generations who are coming into um, the world. And the good news is we're more diverse, more mixed now more than ever. And in a few years, I think there, the, 
the minorities will be the majority in terms of population. In yeah. 2042, yeah. that will happen. Yes. Yeah. In our lifetime, I think that mm -hmm. will happen. But I think it's also a starting point for how do we actually turn it into it's a way of being, it's our history instead of having to relegate months. So I see the good and bad of it. Um, I think the good news is there's a starting point for people who are new and just learning about it, that it's putting some information in their heads that they were not aware of. And so that is beginning to change their reality on how they, you know, relate to the, the different months that we celebrate. So I hear you with that. Well, you know, but it's funny. I, I hear people say, well, you know, we don't have White History Month. Well, no, you do. You have it nine months of the year. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Come on. Well, it has been such a pleasure to actually hang out with you, IRL. It always is. Thank you. Likewise. Um, you are just this amazing, harmonious human being that has actually put harmony into the world. You know, we know, but you, you know, you, you are you are the person, the director behind the scenes that is directing that harmony because you you know you have this 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 platform where you are sharing this, you know, which is a lot wider than I can share. I'm meeting with people one on one, yeah. and you're telling the story to masses. So, oh it's my a partnership. Gosh. I'm gonna hug you, dude. Let's just do this. All Let's right, hug on this couch. I'm gonna <laughs> hug. All right, thank you. dude. And thank you everyone for joining us on Culture Cast. Um, we actually have another guest coming up who I got to meet through you, Charles Sims. Before we wrap, what is the best way to get a hold of you, Daryl? Uh, Daryl, D-A-R-A-Y-L, only one R, Daryl at DarylDavis.com. Super easy. Well, dude, I love you. I heart you. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity yeah. and all yeah. that you do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody.